Hello everyone, today I wanted to talk about a resource that I stumbled across the other day, which I think is really helpful and you'll probably like uh, using it as well. So this is from uh, Andrew Kane. I'll have a link to this in the video description. I highly recommend you come here and check this out uh, because there's so many links in here. I'm not going to click on them all, uh, but it's a production checklist if you want, or like a list of best practices for running your Rails apps in production. And I've covered some of the stuff in here before. Uh, some of it I'm just going to gloss over because it's it's just like reading material for you. Like if you go over to the security best practices section, you just scroll through here, see all the stuff about secrets and SQL injections uh, and make sure you're not doing any of it. Uh, but some of it's, uh, you know, links to important gems you might want to use or services like the roll bar service uh, where some of it's going to be free. Uh, some of it's going to have like a paid tier that you have to sign up for. Personally, I think you're probably good in a lot of cases with putting off the paid services until you're at least making some money off of your application. Uh, but it's ultimately up to you. I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. Uh, and some of the things like logging, I do think are important. Uh, I don't think you need like a whole logging framework, but I do think it's useful to at the very least uh, reduce the amount of logs that are being spit out to it. Because if you come into like your own uh, devlog, for example, in one of your applications. There's just so much stuff in here that really doesn't matter. Uh, and some of it is just poorly formatted, etc. Uh, so I definitely think it's it's not a bad idea to customize your logs and to actually use them, like actually go open up your logs directory if you haven't done that before, because for some reason people just kind of ignore it. Go into your log and then development or production log and actually read what's happening in your application if you're running into an issue. Uh, they also mentioned like auditing libraries. Uh, which we've done something similar. I don't think we used audited necessarily, uh, but we've done stuff before with like uh, auditing your like security audits or uh, like your formatters and stuff like that to make sure that you're running through your code and making sure it's it's up to snuff. Um, we have the <laughs> we have the uh, CDN uh, web request stuff. Uh, you're probably already using Puma. Uh, you have uh, Deflator if you want to for compression. If you're not familiar basically allows you to shrink your page size. Um, you also have the CDN section. Now, if you're not using CDNs uh, and you comment on my videos saying like, I can't believe this, this cringe lord is using a CDN instead of adding bootstrap into his application, blah, 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 blah. Uh, sometimes it's just easier to do that. In most cases, I'm doing that because I'm lazy, but it's, it's always fun to, to start that fight. Um, but CDNs in some cases can be very useful just because it allows you to host this in a way that doesn't interfere with your actual app. Uh, and it allows the, the traffic to sort of be distributed. It also, in terms of distribution, allows you to have a CDN that's probably closer to your customer than your server might be. Like if I'm only running a server in New York, my customer is coming from Europe and I have a CDN that's over in Europe uh, when they visit the website, it might be a little bit easier to serve it that way. Uh, so that's also something to consider. Uh, for background jobs, we've covered Sidekick before and for emails and stuff like that. I'm just going to leave these links here. Uh, SendGrid is personally what I use. It's just a neat little email service. So this is what I use for uh, like DNN.com and a couple other things. The reason why I like them is because in their pricing, they have a, a free tier, which is for like 100 emails a day, I think. Uh, yeah, 100 emails a day. Uh, so that's definitely worth taking a look at. It's useful in all types of applications. Um, in terms of caching and performance, again, I'll just leave these links here because uh, I don't want to take away too much from the guide. I just want to sort of point you to it because it's been pretty interesting to read through. For monitoring, I've definitely heard a lot about New Relic and AppSignal, but I haven't personally used either. Uh, if you come into like pricing for New, uh, New Relic, I think there's a free tier or a standard tier, which starts at $0 a month. So yeah, that's definitely something to take a look at. You have your uptime monitoring, which if you're just running your own application initially, you could probably just uh, refresh it every once in a while to make sure it's up and running. Like, let me just go ahead and do my own uptime uh, monitoring. Yep, the website that gets about 80 visitors a month seems to be doing okay. Uh, so we'll just, <laughs> just close that. Uh, again, don't take it too, don't take this list too seriously if you're just starting out. This is like, what did he say? It's like based on experience from like Instacart which if you're not familiar, they get a little bit more than 80 visitors a month. Um, so definitely worth, you know, taking that in, into consideration. Uh, this is a great list for you to learn from, but as with all things, there's going to be nuance depending on your situation. Don't think you have to go out and spend, you know, 20 bucks on each of these services to make sure that you have like a real official application. You can definitely get away with without needing some of these things, right? Uh, in terms of the database stuff, we have covered PG Hero. I think I just covered that like yesterday. 
Uh, this just allows you to check like uh, the status of your database, make sure all your queries are working, make sure you're not using too much space, etc. cetera. Uh, down here, you got the notable events, which just lets you track failures in your, in your web app. You also have the timeout section, which is really cool. Uh, if you're not familiar, you don't want your, um, you don't want your like Postgres database to just sit there and spin out of control. Uh, so sometimes what you'll do, if you come down here, you'll just add a timeout that tells it like how long it's good to spend before it needs to, uh, to, you know, go back to working. So if you do it, manage to do something really bad, uh, this will hopefully save you. Uh, or if the database, you know, isn't working for some reason, you, it'll just resolve itself. In terms of analytics, we've covered this before. We've covered the Ahoy gem a lot. I'm not even going to talk about the other two, although there are other options like Amplitude Mix Panel. Uh, we're just going to take a look at Ahoy. Uh, this is just like a Google Analytics alternative where you can sort of control what data gets collected. Uh, and, you know, this is really useful just because it's a uh, it's a way for you to collect, let's say, the, the number of visits on each of your pages. Uh, without Google also getting access to that person's IP address, their entire shopping history, uh, and what they had for lunch that day. Uh, and this is also really useful for doing stuff like, I think I've done it before, but if I go over to YouTube and I search for, um, let's see, we can go to, uh, we can go to uh, Ruby on Rails, real-time graph maybe, or real-time chart, uh, real-time analytics. Uh, so what I did here was I combined ChartKick with the uh, Ahoy gem and Turbo to have a chart that updates in real time. If I can just go ahead and open this and mute it. Uh, and we come over here. Uh, basically what happens is as you visit some pages, uh, you'll see the, uh, the history update in real time in this graph. So you get your real time analytics. And it's pretty easy to set up with just like ChartKick and Ahoy uh, and of course Turbo. But uh, yeah, this is definitely a very powerful tool that I recommend you taking a look at. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can track if you want to. The only thing I would say is every time you go to track a new piece of data, update your terms of service uh, and your privacy policy to make sure that your users are aware of what you're doing and what you're using uh, because it's not nice to track people's data. And in a lot of cases, it's not entirely legal to track people's data without their permissions. So make sure you're doing that. That's why with you like Google Analytics, they have like a whole uh, privacy policy acknowledging that you're using Google Analytics because at this point it's so far gone in terms of what they collect uh, that they can't really outline it all. So you like link their privacy policy and your privacy policy and it's a whole mess. So that's where I definitely think Ahoy is easier to work with and probably better for your, your end users. But this isn't really a video about Ahoy. Uh, it's just something I wanted to talk about for a bit because it's probably the thing I'm most familiar with. Uh, in terms of feature flags, we've also covered the other day, we covered the uh, Flipper gem and Rails, uh, which is a way for you to, if we come in here and we hopefully have it muted, uh, it's a way for you to sort of toggle features on and off, uh, even for a couple different users, if I can find the place. Uh, so what we have right here, you can basically set a flag where you can have like 33% of your users um, not have the, the nav bar uh, or 33% 30, of the users won't have access to the new feature. So if we look at this, like right here, you can see 66% of actors have access to the nav bar, which means two and three people uh, randomly will have access to it and one third won't, which is where sometimes you get those like, let, let's say this like weird background that YouTube's doing now where they have like the, the video bleed out into the, the page. Uh, you don't roll that out to all users initially. You roll it out to some, see what their reactions are. And then over time, if if it's working, there's no bugs or anything, you can then uh, roll it out to more users. Uh, alternatively, if they all hate it, you can also just refuse to roll it out, etc. So that's where something like uh, Flipper works. And that's basically what Rollout does. Uh, the reason why I went with Flipper for is just because Rollout hasn't been updated in like a year or two. That's why I went with like the Flipper cloud solution. Uh, but again, they have a... Uh, they have like a free tier you can use, and they also have a self-hosted version for their back end dashboard that you can use. So that's definitely worth taking a look at. Unless you want to use Rollout, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, it's just my personal experience speaking there. Uh, and finally, there is a call for suggestions. So if there's anything else you think should be added to this, uh, I'll have a link to this entire GitHub repo from Andrew in the video description. Uh, and then you can come in here and make a pull request or open an issue and start a conversation. Uh, and go from there. Uh, 
I just thought this was something that was definitely worth taking a look at because this is a wonderful, you know, little list here. And the amount of detail that it goes into with stuff like your, uh, where is it? It's your strong migrations. If we open this up, uh, you know, this is where the list really starts to shine, where it goes through the entire list of uh, things that you you shouldn't do and how you can do them instead. So if you're not familiar with strong migrations, it's basically a way for you to ensure that you are migrating correctly. Uh, it's like a, a way for you to assert that you've done the correct thing, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, so what you do is instead of just removing a column, because if you have like a race condition, it might, uh, you know, cause the, the user to retrieve some data that no longer exists, or it might cause them to try to retrieve some data that no longer exists. Uh, you can first start by having the model ignore the column, deploy that code. So then after the model's done ignoring it, all of those requests go through. You now know nothing's touching the column. So now you can use safety assured, which is just a fancy way of saying you're, you've done your due diligence. Uh, it doesn't inherently mean that it's safe. Uh, it's the, the implication of putting this here is it's your seal of approval saying that you verified this is safe. Now let's go ahead and let's remove this column because nothing's using it because it's ignored, etc. And there's other options here for the other the other uh, ways of migrating your database. Uh, and this whole list is really useful. Uh, and that's where I think this uh, this entire production checklist really shines. It's not necessarily the list itself. It's the links to the resources. So that's why I'm going to have the link in the video description. Uh, just something that I thought was worth covering because it does seem very useful. But yeah, that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully uh, you uh, enjoyed. Uh, I'll also have a link to this in the pinned comment so you can go ahead and click on it there. Uh, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.